I think perhaps that we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll get started. And um, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to our AO Spine North America um, webinar on advances in the management and decision making around uh, degenerative cervical myelopathy. And uh, we just want to thank um, AO Spine North America for facilitating uh, uh, this evening's webinar. Uh, as well as for their uh, wonderful support of the fellowship program and also a big shout out uh, to all of the uh, fellows and um, fellowship directors who may be joining us uh, this evening. Uh, so I'll be moderating uh, this, this evening's uh, a webinar. I'm a professor of neurosurgery at the University of uh, Toronto and I'll be joined um, by uh, two distinguished faculty uh, professors uh, Zohair Agogawala, who is a professor and chair of neurosurgery at Tufts University School of Medicine, where he is uh, also the co-director of the Comparative Effectiveness Research Institute. And I'm joined by uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Jefferson Wilson, who is a LVAT chair in neurosurgery and associate professor at the University of Toronto, St. Michael's uh, uh, Hospital. So this is uh, really a uh, part of a fantastic fellows webinar a, a series, and these occur on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And the kickoff was in, in the early fall on se September 13th. And these occur on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And you can see some of the upcoming um, webinar topics. Uh, so May 25th, uh, complications and legal, re legal ramifications in spine surgery. Uh, August 24th on lateral interbody uh, techniques, September 21st on thoracolumbar uh, trauma, and November 16th on navigation and uh, robotics. And uh, the AONA uh, website uh, listed below is a great source of information. And so this is just a shout out to the August 26th, 27th, uh, 2022 uh, AOSpine um, uh, North America uh, 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 seminar. So uh, uh, AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty uh, dedicated to improving the lives of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, so so the, um, this group is uh, devoted toward uh, education and, and research, but does not endorse or promote any particular products of, or services uh, related to any commercial uh, entity and any equipment used in, in, in these courses for demonstration and teaching purposes. And of course, tonight will, will really be around uh, a, a principles, content knowledge, and, and decision making. So I think all of you are know, know all about Zoom etiquette, but just to remind yourselves that your microphones have been muted and cameras turned off. Uh, so please send all the questions uh, or any technical concerns or issues through the Q and A box, and uh, I'll, I'll be monitoring that along with our uh, uh, AO North America team. So I will review and kind of try to uh, field the questions as they appear uh, in the Q&A box and we'll kind of handle these um, as, 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 uh, as is appropriate. And the chat function will be disabled for course participants. So all of you realize that degenerative cervical myelopathy is the commonest form of non-traumatic uh, spinal cord injury in the world. It's an extremely common uh, issue that, that all of us uh, 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 treat. And, and so tonight we're going to be uh, uh, providing uh, some perspectives on the current state of the art of degenerative cervical myelopathy and also addressing some challenging, some controversial issues related to decision making. When you go anterior, when you go posterior, what, what techniques would you use? And then also, um, you know, when do you pull the trigger on someone with mild cervical myelopathy and when do you watch them? You know, that can be sometimes quite challenging. So the learning uh, objectives are uh, to develop clinically relevant understanding of the concepts and pathobiology of DCM and to have a working understanding of the current AO spine guidelines for the management of this condition, uh, to have a working knowledge of the different surgical techniques and, and where they might be best applied to manage uh, DCM. And then also to have a better understanding of the assessment and management of individuals with mild DCM. And, and increasingly we're, we're gonna be seeing a lot of these patients. So, so here's the agenda. Um, and so we'll start off with that with a case with some polling questions. Um, and then I'll give an overview. Uh, Zoe Gogawala will then talk about decision making and here versus posterior. Jeff Wilson will talk about the challenges related to mild DCM and tips some tips on decision making. 
then we'll come back to the cases and we'll poll you again. We'll see if there's been any shifts in your uh, responses and then we'll open it up for uh, questions uh, and, and answers. So thank you. Uh, and I think we'll uh, kind of get started then with the cases. And so um, we'll start off with this uh, patient here. So these are uh, the sagittal T1, T2 MRIs on a, on a 67 year old woman. And she's really, her main issue is really mild neck pain. And on close questioning, she's got a, a little bit of bilateral particular arm pain, perhaps a titch of, of, of hand weakness. Um, and when, when you examine her, she does have some uh, uh, subtle neurological uh, findings. Her gait might be a little bit wide based, but she's really functioning well. And we judge her MGUA to be at 16. So here are some of the axial images at C5 and C5-6. C6 and C67. Okay, so polling question one. Which management uh, strategy would you uh, uh, suggest uh, for this patient? So surgical intervention, uh, obtain some additional studies, for example, neurophysiological studies and advise that if these are abnormal, then surgery should be undertaken. Uh, trial of non-operative uh, management and dis with discharge back to the primary care physician with the option of re-referral or non-operative management, advising a structured physiotherapy program with a follow-up review in three to six months and advice for surgery if there's a deterioration clinically. So let's see um, what people think here. Okay, so a minority uh, favorite surgery. Um, and most um, uh, favored, uh, of course, a non-operative management, but uh, a number of people wanted to get neurophysiological studies um, and uh, just a handful of people uh, opted to discharge back to the primary care uh, practitioner. Okay, so um, polling question uh, two. So, so let's say that, uh, we go with the majority opinion, and we do have, of course, a structured physiotherapy, and we have a clinical follow-up at four months. And here's a review at, at four months. The imaging studies are the same, uh, but now there's been a, a, a bit of increased uh, weakness, um, and you judge the MUA to be 14, and previously it was a 16, so now uh, the neurological findings are more apparent, and the patient now does admit to impaired gait and that she actually is a bit concerned about some of these uh, symptoms. So polling question two. So what management strategy would you advise at this point? Surgical intervention, uh, continued non-operative management with clinical and imaging follow because the patient still has good function. They're in good shape. Uh, you know, they have some impairment, but not too bad. Or discharge back to the primary care practitioner and refer in the event of a significant functional decline. So that is if there's really a hard neurology with a, with a major uh, functional impairment. Okay, well, it looks like um, uh, everyone would favor surgery uh, here. So that's good. Um, and then polling question three. So let's assume that you do a surgical approach, which I guess I'm hinting is the correct answer here, I believe. Uh, so what's the best surgical strategy? Now, now things get interesting. Okay, so here we have the, this um, uh, T2 uh, and T1 MRI, so multi-level cervical spondylosis, a little bit of straightening of the cervical spine, but relative preservation of global lordosis. Um, so what would you do? So here are the options. So option one is a multi-level anterior decompression infusion. Option two is a posterior cervical laminectomy, so uninstrumented by whatever choice you wanna do. Option three is a cervical laminectomy infusion. Option four is a cervical laminoplasty. And the final option is a combined front back approach to deal with both the anterior and posterior uh, issues. So uh, let's see uh, what uh, you think should be done here. Okay, so that's, uh, so that's cool. So there's a whole host of uh, options uh, here. So 21% multi-level ACDF, a minority a laminectomy alone, probably the majority would do a laminectomy and fusion. Uh, um, 
uh, some people in favor of uh, laminoplasty, and then a substantial minority would do a combined anterior posterior procedure. Okay, so we'll come back to this case. I'll we'll repoll you at the end of the lectures, and I'll show you what I did. Um, uh, and you know, I I picked this case because there are a variety of uh, of, of options uh, available. So I'm going to begin uh, this evening uh, just with a uh, uh, kind of an overview of state-of-the-art future directions. So no relevant commercial disclosures. So I'll talk briefly about the concept of DCM and the pathobiology. I'll talk about some of the different surgical uh, treatment uh, options and in particular, kind of provide some of the evidence that surgery uh, does work, it is cost-effective. And I'll briefly uh, review the, uh, the guidelines. And then importantly, I'll talk about knowledge gaps. And I think this is really important to, to highlight on because while we understand a great deal about the condition, we also don't understand a lot of things. So particularly mild DCM and, um, you know, can we take greater advantage of some of the microstructural imaging techniques? And then how do we optimize the neurological outcomes? Because uh, let's face it, despite uh, excellent surgical treatment, many patients are left with residual impairment. So surgery is not perfect. So, so we, uh, we first coined the term uh, 2015, this term of degenerative cervical myelopathy. And originally I was using cervical spondylotic myelopathy as an overarching term. And I was getting a lot of pushback from uh, my Asian colleagues saying that, you know, CSM and, and OPLL are different. Well, they are, they aren't, I thought. And um, so we came up with this overarching term. And the idea here is that this would encompass really the spectrum of benign non-neoplastic non-traumatic pathologies that result in progressive cord compression. And the two commonest entities are cervical spondylotic myelopathy and OPLL, and then it includes a whole variety of other types of um, types of situations. And, and we realize that in particular, cervical spondylotic myelopathy comes in many different uh, flavors with fairly simple uh, one or two level spondylosis to deformity and, and, and instability and, uh, and so on. So there are three major components to the pathobiology. So there are static factors, so compression, and then this results in ischemia. Then there are dynamic factors because the spine moves and it has a, a correct alignment. So you can have dynamic compression and there can be axial tension on nerve fibers. And then there are biomolecular factors and this can provoke inflammation and cell death uh, can occur through ischemia and excitotoxicity. So we classify um, uh, the clinical presentation of DCM using the Modified Japanese Orthopedic Association scale, which has now been validated uh, through prospective AO studies. This is the scale, so there are four domains, upper and lower extremities, uh, sensory um, dysfunction, and then sphincter dysfunction. Someone who is perfect has an 18, mild myelopathy is 15 to 17, and then moderate and severe are shown this on the slide. So there's many excellent surgical options. This is a, a focus issue that um, actually AO Spine North America put together uh, about almost a decade ago. I'll just give you a sense of you know, some of the options and also give you a sense of my own thinking. So this is a patient who's got multi-level cervical spondylosis, but this, the cervical spine is kyphotic. So posterior decompression alone will work very well here. And uh, so I actually, and this is reducible, so I actually like a multi-level uh, a, 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 a CDF, and you can actually do this as a standalone procedure, uh, provided you are careful with the amount of end plate resection. And then occasionally you need to include a corpectomy if there's a disease by the vertebral body, and you can include this with a, an ACDF, so so called hybrid procedure. And then put, there are posterior options, so there's laminectomy infusion, and then a laminoplasty, uh, um, particularly if there's main, maintenance of cervical uh, 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 lordosis. And then for anterior posterior techniques, I really reserve this if there's a fixed kyphosis where you need to do a multi-level anterior um, decompression and reconstruction, and then I will back this up with a posterior uh, approach. And this is uh, an example here of such a case. So just, just a shout out to uh, Zogo Gawala's um, landmark randomized trial published uh, last year in JAMA. And Zoe was looking at patients where there's equipoise between anterior and posterior surgery. So which is the better uh, option? And so what was cool was that the patients would be enrolled and then there would be a review panel that would examine the cases to make sure that there was, that there was equipoise in terms of anterior and posterior 
types of uh, uh, types of approaches. So uh, these are the outcomes of the year, and the main outcome was looking at the SF36 scores, and essentially showed equivalence of anterior and posterior approaches. So these are the um, the dorsal approaches, and these are the anterior approaches. The up lines are patients who've improved. And then this is comparing the trajectory changes over time uh, and comparing anterior posterior. So at least looking for all comers in this uh, study uh, and looking at the SF36 scores, it looks like anterior posterior techniques uh, do as well. Now there may be nuances, let's say if you look at mild or myelopathy, maybe Jeff will talk a bit about that. So it's recognized that DCM has an important impact both in terms of the health of individuals and economic in terms of the economics as well. And there probably are more economic studies uh, that are uh, uh, required. And there's also been a paradigm shift that's occurred. So uh, it used to be thought that, you know, you really would not operate until patients were, were really very disabled. And then you would tell patients, well, you're not gonna get any better, but maybe we can hold you where you are. And we now recognize that's not correct. That in fact, the expectation is that you should operate before patients have severe impairment and most patients will improve. And so, um, you know, these are the results from the AO uh, Spine North America uh, a study published in JBJS almost a decade ago. And here we showed that there were major improvements in the MGOA scores, reductions in disabilities measured by the neck disability index, and major improvements in SF36 physical and mental component uh, scores. And then we replicated this uh, in the international perspectives, was published two years later. It, essentially, these are a mirror image of those results. So uh, this is a treatment that works all over the world. And then regardless of race, culture, um, socioeconomic uh, uh, issues and so on and so forth. And so this is the paradigm shift that's occurred in terms of the uh, effectiveness of uh, uh, surgery. And this is just a shout out to uh, one of uh, a colleague of uh, Jeff and myself at University of Toronto. And this was uh, Chris Whitew's um, master's thesis, which he did at the uh, uh, University of, uh, of uh, Chicago, and uh, I had some involvement in this as well. And essentially what Chris uh, showed, and I won't go through all the, of, of the beautiful data that he had, but essentially he showed quite convincingly that uh, surgery for degenerative cervical myelopathy is very cost effective. So with all of this background, it was felt that it was high time that we initiated uh, guidelines. And so these were published in 2017 in the Global Spine Journal. And this is kind of a snippet of the systematic reviews that were done. So these are the forest plots showing the effectiveness of surgery at short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term follow-up. And so you then take this evidence, you filter this through a multidisciplinary guidelines group, and we use what's called the GRADE process. So you look at the best available evidence, you look at the acceptability of the treatments, patient values, benefits versus harms, and, and, um, and the costs. And essentially, Based on this, there was a very clear recommendation for moderate and severe myelopathy. So surgery is clearly recommended. Uh, and for mild myelopathy, this is where there is more uncertainty and there, there can be some equipoise and you may either, depending on the patient's wishes, your own views on this, opt for surgery up front or perhaps for a course of structural rehabilitation with follow-up. And then if the patient declines, then it would be advisable to undertake surgery. So there's a lot of interest in trying to predict who does well with surgery and who does less well. And this is, you know, th th this is a, a paper that just kind of was kind of a first effort at this. There's a lot of work that's now uh, um, in play, but essentially some of the factors that, um, that determine how patients do with the age. So older patients do less well, it's still worth it, but they do less well. If there's a long duration of symptoms that can negatively impact psychiatric comorbidity, can certainly impact how individuals perceive that they're doing. And then issues like smoking uh, and the baseline neurological impairment. So knowledge gaps. So we need to optimize the management of mild DCM. And, and Jeff will talk about this in, in some detail. We need to better understand the natural history. We need better outcome measures. Potentially microstructural MRI might be an imaging biomarker. And ultimately, perhaps genetics and um, and other serological biomarkers may come into play. And then also, you know, there are patients that don't do as well as we would hope, or patients that arrive on our doorstep with very severe myelopathy, 
you know, how do we help these uh, patients? And this is potentially where, you know, basic science um, uh, efforts in um, neuroprotection or regeneration might have an impact. I'll just briefly share an initial effort to try to translate some of these discoveries with the Rilliazol trial, CSM Protect trial. And not everybody with mild myelopathy does so great. Okay, so this is a former a fellow of ours in Toronto, who is now at UC Davis, Alan Martin. And, and, and we uh, followed 117 patients, mainly with mild, but some with moderate myelopathy. And these are patients who declined surgery. And then when we followed them over two and a half years, 50% uh, declined. And by the way, conventional MRI was totally insensitive to detect uh, changes. You know, we do it, but don't anticipate that that's gonna somehow have triggered necessarily the decision to operate. And potentially a uh, multi-parametric quantitative MRI is shown with some of these uh, techniques uh, uh, here can be uh, helpful. So diffusion tensor imaging, magnetization transfer, and so on. And in particular, a T2 weighted star imaging, white matter to gray matter ratio may be uh, a very interesting uh, technique. And so finally, just in closing, just to highlight some of the uh, results from the CSM Protect uh, trial. This was really repurposing of a drug that's now used commonly for ALS to slow down nerve cell degeneration. This is really is all. This is a sodium glutamate antagonist. It's actually the only FDA approved neuroprotective uh, a, a drug. This is the publication in The Lancet. And, um, and you know, while most patients improve, not everybody does, uh, does uh, so great. So here in blue are the patients who improve. Some improve a lot, some just a little. Some people in green uh, don't improve. We stabilize them. And the patients in red, you know, there are some patients who decline. And there are low but definite perioperative uh, risks, including delayed C5 uh, palsy. And Aureliazole has been shown to be effective in animal models of degenerative cervical myelopathy. And very interestingly, it has a big impact on neuropathic pain. And there may be some, uh, some clinical advantages on, on that side. So this is a trial that was published. Uh, the protocol was, was published up front. 300 patients, 16 sites. Patients got Riliazol or placebo in a blinded randomized fashion uh, for two weeks prior to surgery and then for four weeks uh, afterwards. The main outcome measure was the MGOA, which is probably in hindsight, uh, not the best outcome measure to choose. Um, we kind of have learned this over, uh, over time, but we, that was the outcome measure we chose. And then we have a variety of secondary outcomes. And I'll, I'll talk in particular about the um, neck and arm pain uh, outcomes. So the mean age was 58, follow up is 90%. And here we see the, the main results. So uh, we see a baseline, uh, the Riliazole and placebo, and the major improvements with surgery. Uh, so that replicates previous results, but we could not discern any impact of Riliazole on MGOA scores. Interestingly, on a variety of secondary outcome measures, and I'll highlight here the, some of the pain outcome measures, we did see a signal. So there was a significant improvement in neck and arm pain, which is interesting. And this was actually associated with an improvement in the SF36 physical function subdomain. And there were changes in Asian motor score, small changes likely reflective of head intrinsic uh, function improvements. So, so we missed the primary outcome. Uh, so we did not see a benefit with six, with uh, six week perioperative parts of really result on the MGOA scores, but there were some interesting signals seen, in particularly with neck and arm pain. And so it raises the question: you know, would a longer duration of treatment have been uh, effective? And what about more sensitive outcome measures, or should we be targeting patients you know who have a lot of neuropathic pain? Looking at that, and so you know, I think that this uh, warrants uh, further uh, further study. So take home messages. So DCM is the commonest cause of spinal cord impairment in the world. Uh, surgical treatment of DCM is uh, safe, um, uh, improves neurological function, uh, quality of life, and is cost effective. And future directions, uh, there is an uh, AOSpine Recode project through AOSpine uh, International, which is kind of looking at raising awareness and developing diagnostic criteria for a DCM. And we need to optimize the patients for mild DCM. Jeff will talk about this. We need uh, improved biomarkers. And ultimately, I think that there is an opportunity to translate some of the basic science knowledge to have potentially some complementary pharmacological or, or other biologic treatments uh, to treat this common form of um, a degenerative cervical uh, myelopathy. Very good, so thank you. So I, I don't see, um,
Uh, oh yeah, there's Professor Gogowala. Perfect. Welcome, Zoe. Okay, excellent. So welcome to Professor Gogowala, who I uh, from the Leahy Clinic, who I uh, introduced before, and I uh, uh, gave a little a snippet of some of Zoe's uh, landmark uh, work. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, here. And uh, you know, I picked a case where there I think is equipoise between anterior and posterior uh, techniques. And I think on that note, um, uh, 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 Zoe, if you would be kind enough to deliver your uh, lecture on decision making, uh, surgical decision making, in degenerative cervical myelopathy, you know, anterior versus posterior. Terrific. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for the opportunity to, uh, to present uh, at the uh, AO Spine North America Fellows uh, Seminar. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you, and uh, certainly it's an enormous and uh, humbling experience to follow um, uh, Professor Failings uh, at, this, uh, uh, at this moment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about approach selection for cervical myelopathy, anterior versus uh, posterior approaches. And um, uh, as I do that, um, I just want to acknowledge uh, a few mentors and colleagues, uh, Seppi Hanjani, Dan Resnick, uh, Fred Barker, and Ed Benzel who've been uh, enormously uh, helpful uh, in some of the ideas that uh, I wanna share with all of you today. Um, also, I wanted to uh, uh, mention the uh, trial that uh, uh, Professor Failings mentioned uh, that I'll also uh, talk with all of you about the CMS, uh, CSMS uh, trial, uh, as well as some uh, foundation uh, support for uh, hospital cost analysis, and uh, also uh, acknowledge some uh, 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 involvement in uh, intellectual property and shares in a, a commercial entity that has nothing to do with this uh, presentation. And perhaps importantly, I wanted to, uh, to uh, uh, mention that I plan to discuss approaches to cervical myelopathy, engage in a discussion with all of you uh, between anterior and posterior approaches. Um, but I hope that one of the messages that I, I deliver and may in some ways uh, represent a bias is that laminoplasty uh, may be a way to go for uh, many cases and that there's new data that, uh, that may ch change uh, our practice uh, ultimately in this regard. Um, I should mention all of our CSMS uh, investigators, uh, Ed Benzel, Rob Whitmore, Adam Cantor, Erica Bisson, Bob Heary, Subu McGay, Todd Albert, uh, Dan Rue, Marjorie Wong, Melissa Dunbar, Janice Breeze, Praveen Mumanini, Fred Barker, Jim Harrop, uh, Michael Failings, Paul Arnold, uh, Michael uh, Steinmetz, and John Heller. So a wide mix of both orthopedic and neurosurgery uh, colleagues. We also had a number of international uh, uh, experts and people who served on this expert panel that, uh, that Dr. Failings mentioned, uh, Astrobal Falvinia, Sig Bourbon, Alan Hillebrand, Vidnantam uh, Rod Shaker, Dan Resnick, Tanvir Chaudhry, Jean-Valerie Kumans, Paul McCormick, and Jeff uh, Wong. So just to the backdrop, uh, cervical myelopathy uh, is uh, the uh, number one uh, cause of spinal cord dysfunction. I think we all recognize this. We recognize the importance of uh, this disorder. Um, uh, Dr. Failings mentioned that surgery is very effective in treating uh, myelopathy, degenerative myelopathy, but there are complications that are significant, ranging between 15 and 18% of patients that we treat. Hospital charges are also significant in the United States. For example, we spend $2 billion a year in surgical treatment of myelopathy. We estimate that we um, uh, apply this treatment to 40,000 patients uh, per year. And there's a wide range of uh, surgical treatments that we use from anterior and posterior. Um, also, as we look at Asia and Europe, we recognize that laminoplasty is a more uh, significant treatment option that's applied. Whereas in North America, we tend to focus our attention on ventral and dorsal uh, fusion surgeries. As we look at guidelines that have been published on the uh, topic, and uh, Dr. Failings mentioned guidelines uh, also for cervical myelopathy, the WNS and CNS have published guidelines that were issued in 2009. Both laminectomy and fusion, as well as laminoplasty, are effective treatments for uh, cervical myelopathy, as well as uh, anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. Um, and over the last 50 years, I would say we have debated anterior and posterior surgery for CSM. Many of us have our biases and we cite 
relatively small retrospective studies to support uh, that particular bias. But uh, until more recently, there have been um, uh, really a lack of prospective uh, trials that compare anterior and posterior approaches uh, in a really meaningful way. Um, there was a case that I had uh, uh, submitted for uh, early review uh, uh, in this regard. Uh, and there is uh, a, a case image that I show here, which uh, demonstrates cervical stenosis at the uh, C4, C5, and C5, C6 uh, levels. Uh, you see at the C5, C6 level that there's uh, some cord signal edema. And uh, there's a wide variety of approaches uh, to this. This particular uh, individual patient sought four surgical opinions and got both anterior and posterior uh, recommendations. Uh, in one case, uh, both an anterior and posterior uh, recommendation for surgery. He happened to have undergone an ACDF at the C4, C5, and C5, C6 level. And naturally, I think we ask ourselves, was this the best operation? Does anyone know? And importantly, does it matter? We have a number of studies that have looked at the comparative effectiveness of surgery for cervical myelopathy. Uh, as Dr. Failings mentioned, surgery for cervical myelopathy is effective. Even patients with mild cervical myelopathy benefit from surgery, but there's some differential complication rates as the AO prospective uh, studies uh, demonstrated. Ventral surgery with a 12% complication rate, dorsal surgery with a higher 18% complication rate. But these populations were not completely comparable. Those patients with dorsal surgery in the AO studies um, had more complexity, uh, were older, and uh, may have had reasons why they had uh, more complications. So one of the things that we thought we would do is do a uh, prospective and comparative trial, a randomized trial to compare uh, anterior versus posterior surgery, recognizing that ventral decompression infusion, dorsal laminectomy infusion, as well as laminoplasty would be viable options um, so that we divided patients in a two to three distribution so that we would have more patients in the posterior arm to compare dorsal laminectomy infusion to dorsal laminoplasty. We had a study population that included patients 45 to 80 years of age with two or more levels of stenosis. We excluded patients with segmental kyphotic deformity, patients with kyphosis greater than five degrees in extension, significant structural OPLL, history of previous surgery, and patients with major comorbidities. And as uh, Dr. Failings mentioned, we employed a relatively novel technique where we had a spinal experts review of each case, the idea being to preserve the ethics of doing a randomized control trial, where 15 experts would look at each case and vote whether a patient was eligible for randomization or not, and also would state what they would do in this particular case so that if greater than 80% of surgeons who reviewed a case felt that the same operation uh, should be done, then perhaps this would not represent clinical equipoise and the patient should not be randomized into the trial. And we published a protocol uh, for this prior to doing the trial. I show you just a couple of examples here. This is a patient uh, that was uh, submitted to the spinal experts uh, panel. Uh, you can see here the sagittal MRI image demonstrating multi-level uh, stenosis. Here you see a spondylolisthesis at the C3, C4 level, and that spondylolisthesis is mobile on flexion and extension. The patient was a 60-year-old with multiple falls and clumsy hands, myelopathy on exam, uh, and the uh, imaging findings as I uh, described. And as the experts uh, reviewed this case, uh, the, uh, there was a wide range of opinion ranging from anterior corpectomy to posterior laminectomy and fusion. No votes for laminoplasty in this case, but the patient was eligible for randomization. Uh, and here I can just show you what different surgeons uh, in different parts of the country uh, said about this particular case. Uh, and you can see there were opinions for uh, ACDNF, multi-level ACDNF in the case of uh, Professor Failings, uh, and also for uh, posterior cervical uh, surgery uh, as well. The patient was randomized because there was clinical equipoise between anterior and posterior surgery. Here's another uh, example of a patient who had uh, multiple people look at the case. 13 people voted. There were votes for anterior surgery with fusion, posterior surgery with fusion, 
as well as laminoplasty, and the patient was randomized uh, into this trial. And I show you an example where there was a congenital canal narrowing, preserved lordosis, four levels of uh, cervical stenosis. And uh, here there was a dominant vote for laminoplasty, and the patient was not randomized uh, into the trial. So I present this to show to you that not all patients with cervical myelopathy uh, were eligible for this trial, and we need to view the trial's results uh, in that context. So this was a study design where we did a randomized controlled trial of a specific population of patients that we felt represented clinical equipoise, uh, divided this two to three, so that we were uh, including more patients of the uh, dorsal arm. We had a sample size that estimated that we need 159 randomized patients in order to uh, have a chance of detecting a difference uh, in the populations if one existed. We had 15 uh, major uh, centers uh, participate uh, and had NIH and uh, PCORI funding to uh, execute the trial. We defined our primary outcome measure as a one-year change in the SF36 physical component summary score with an MCID of five points. Secondary outcomes included these patient-reported outcome measures at three, six, and 12 months, as well as complications, productivity, return to work, and health resource utilization uh, to look at radiology, physical therapy, and opioid utilization, for example. Um, Professor Bailings, uh, Failings mentioned uh, kindly that uh, we published the results uh, in JAMA last year, and uh, I'll just uh, highlight a, a couple of those results. We had broad representation uh, from multiple sites. 159 was our goal. We randomized 163 patients with 66 patients being treated with ventral fusion, 68 patients with dorsal fusion, and 29 with laminoplasty. And in terms of study execution, 458 patients were screened for this trial, 269 ultimately enrolled, 163 randomized, and 95% follow-up at one year. And importantly, we had 80% follow-up at two years and 70% so far follow-up at three and at four years. In terms of our baseline characteristics, the randomization process was effective. There were no differences between patients treated with ventral or dorsal surgery. And in fact, no differences that we uh, measured between ventral surgery, laminectomy infusion, and laminoplasty. Importantly, the levels of stenosis, 2.8 overall, was not, difference, uh, not different amongst the groups. Uh, Dr. Phelan showed this graph, and it uh, represents a uh, mounted plot showing that there's no overall difference between ventral and dorsal fusion surgery uh, and uh, dorsal laminoplasty when grouped uh, together. One thing I'll point your attention to is that there are some patients who decline after surgery. Here, the red is the uh, dorsal fusion patients. The uh, blue is the uh, ventral fusion uh, patients. And that's something I think that we need to pay attention to. But that overall, uh, there was uh, no difference uh, between patients treated with anterior versus posterior surgery. I will draw your attention, though, to uh, the uh, primary outcome, the SF36 physical component summary score where we followed patients over four years, and those patients treated with laminoplasty, not randomized to laminoplasty, but selected for laminoplasty by the uh, surgeon and the uh, patient, uh, had superior outcomes in the SF36 physical component summary score at one, two, three, and four years. So I think an important uh, finding uh, that uh, we should highlight. When we looked at laminoplasty, there was also fewer complications uh, between patients treated with ventral and dorsal fusion and laminoplasty, 10.7% versus higher rates of complications uh, in the other cohorts. And uh, although the data is early uh, and we've started to look over four years, reoperation rate has been low in all of the cohorts, but has been lower uh, in the laminoplasty cohort. What about neck pain after surgery? Um, a lot of people, and there's literature to suggest, that patients treated with uh, laminoplasty may have neck pain after surgery. This trial did not bear that out in terms of looking at the neck disability index, but I should point out that uh, uh, Professor Hosono uh, in 1996 uh, looked at uh, laminoplasty and complications and found a 60% rate of axial neck pain uh, after laminoplasty surgery. Uh, one of the things that's been observed over time, and Hosono himself clarified, that the source of axial pain after laminoplasty may result in or may be a consequence of how the laminoplasty is performed 
uh, specifically attachments to the uh, C2 uh, as well as the C7 spinous process may be important in this regard. And Dan Rue, in a, uh, in a uh, review and systematic uh, uh, review of this uh, literature, also highlighted that preserving attachments to C2 and to C7 may be important to reduce axial neck pain after uh, laminoplasty. Also, and importantly, uh, cervical immobilization after laminoplasty uh, was used initially uh, and is now largely not used and may also be important in a reduction of the axial neck pain after this type of surgery. There are people who've looked at this subsequently. Praveen Mumanini and his group in 2017 looked at laminoplasty versus laminectomy infusion. And while they found that laminoplasty was associated with less blood loss and a shorter hospital stay, and laminoplasty uh, and fusion was associated with more long-term complications, the overall neck pain in a contemporary series comparing laminoplasty versus laminectomy and fusion was not different uh, between the two groups. Um, particularly patients with uh, a cervical lordosis greater than 20 degrees, laminoplasty patients had less neck pain. What about the uh, sagittal vertebral axis? This has also emerged as an important concept in looking at patients being treated for cervical degenerative disease. Um, Praveen's group found no difference in the postoperative SVA among patients with laminoplasty and laminectomy infusion. Uh, Roguski uh, and colleagues, on the other hand, uh, found that uh, SVA was greater in patients who were treated with posterior cervical decompression and fusion. And when the SVA was greater than 40 millimeters, there was a reduction in the overall health-related quality of life, even if there was an improvement in patient's myelopathy. This is an important point, which has been demonstrated by other groups. Here, this graph kind of just illustrates that point, that a substantial increase in the uh, patient quality of life when the SVA is less than 40 millimeters, um, but that uh, improvement in the health-related quality of life is lost when the patient's SVA is greater than 40 uh, millimeters after surgery. So we looked in this trial at return to work, and we saw that the patients treated with laminoplasty, as well as ventral uh, decompression and fusion, had a favorable return to work profile. All of the uh, patients in the trial had uh, a, a, a favorable return to work uh, uh, profile, ultimately by one year, but return to work was uh, faster uh, for patients treated with laminoplasty and the return to work at three months for patients treated with posterior fusion was worse. We looked at the uh, health resource utilization and we found that patients treated with laminoplasty had less utilization of diagnostic imaging, less utilization of ongoing physical therapy at one year and less utilization of opioids um, also at, uh, by one year. In terms of hospital charges, uh, ventral fusion and dorsal fusion uh, more expensive procedures compared with uh, dorsal laminoplasty. This is uh, economic data from the American sites uh, in this trial. Um, but I think I would like to just, uh, uh, as I close this uh, discussion, highlight a few points that laminoplasty, while I've presented some very favorable data, is not for all patients, uh, certainly. Laminoplasty uh, may be uh, effective in many cases, but it's not appropriate for patients with uh, cervical kyphosis uh, greater than 13 degrees not ideal for patients with uh, neck pain or with poor sagittal uh, alignment. Um, also, uh, laminoplasty is uh, not ideal for patients with uh, mobile spondylolisthesis and neck pain or with previous uh, decompression uh, surgery uh, or with patients with epidural uh, fibrosis. Um, however, it has a place. And uh, I just uh, want to show you a couple of cases here where um, uh, both uh, uh, Wang and colleagues, as well as uh, Matsumoto and colleagues, uh, looked at patients who had been previously treated with anterior cervical fusion, developed adjacent level uh, stenosis, and were then treated with uh, cervical laminoplasty uh, and had uh, favorable results in many of these cases. So sometimes a good salvage uh, option uh, when patients have already been treated uh, with uh, anterior cervical uh, fusion surgery. So laminoplasty may be appropriate for many patients who have no kyphosis, no segmental motion with axial neck pain, a normal SVA, no hill type uh, OPLL, and is also perhaps ideal for patients with congenital canal narrowing with multi-level stenosis and adjacent level stenosis after ACDNF. Uh, 
Um, in this particular trial that I shared with you this evening, laminoplasty was associated with superior health-related quality of life using the SF36 physical component summary scores over four years, was associated with fewer complications, faster return to work, less outpatient health resource utilization at a year, and less hospital charges. Laminectomy infusion, while a very effective operation for certain patients, uh, can be associated with higher cost, less improvement in health-related quality of life by comparison, more complications, and there are some studies that show a worsening post-operative uh, SVA uh, in these cases. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this discussion, and I look forward to uh, more discussion with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Gogawala, for an excellent uh, uh, talk. And um, this stage um, would, uh, would welcome uh, all of the participants to post your questions in the Q&A, uh, so please do that. And I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Jefferson Wilson from the University of uh, Toronto uh, to present his, um, his, his thoughts on the uh, challenges and controversies around managing mild degenerative cervical myelopathy. Uh, Zoe, if you would uh, perhaps uh, stop sharing your screen kindly, and then we'll ask Jeff to uh, share his screen. So uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here and uh, kind of to follow um, these two giants in the world of cervical myelopathy is no small feat. Um, but I just wanted to, 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 to touch on a, a topic that I think is an important one. I think in spine surgery, just like in life, some of the most interesting topics are, are in the margins or in, on, on the fringes. And I think that's the case with this one. Um, I think we're pretty uh, well-versed in understanding how to treat patients with moderate or severe cervical myelopathy. The decision is usually to offer surgery, but for patients with mild cervical myelopathy, I think there are still some unanswered questions specifically about when to operate and uh, maybe who should be getting earlier surgery and uh, perhaps who could be watched carefully and perhaps surgery could be delayed in certain individuals. So I'm just gonna spend a little time talking about this, um, specifically review the evidence surrounding the natural history of mild cervical myelopathy, talk about the evidence surrounding operative versus non-operative treatment for mild DCM. And we'll, we'll, we'll finish by talking on uh, an uh, interrelated topic, uh, not directly mild myelopathy, but patients with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic cervical uh, 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 canal narrowing to talk about what the evidence for treatment is in that patient population. So um, Dr. Failings discussed uh, what I think are the well-known uh, static and dynamic uh, uh, factors that lead to compression of the cervical spinal cord and, and myelopathy development. I think we're all also very familiar with the symptoms and signs that typify a diagnosis of cervical myelopathy, but I think what's under discussed is the fact that this is really a, a heterogeneous disease entity and patients occupy a spectrum of disease from severely impaired and disabled to, to really mildly affected. I think in, increasingly in the modern day, we're seeing more patients on the mild end of the spectrum with the ubiquity of, of MRI imaging we're seeing a lot of patients that get MRIs for mild neurologic symptoms or neck pain, and a lot of them uh, end up having evidence of cord compression, and um, we're left to try to sort these folks out. So really, what is the best way to manage patients with mild cervical myelopathy? One of the nice things about the guidelines is it did stratify um, recommendations surrounding treatment uh, based on the myelopathy severity. So we, we talk about mild cervical myelopathy by convention being an MJOA uh, between 15 and 17, moderate between 12 and 14, and severe patients have an MJOA less than 12. So um, just looking at how the guidelines made recommendations uh, surrounding these different myelopathy severity groups, so I think it's useful just to show a few cases. Uh, so this is a 68-year-old retired teacher, and he had progressive difficulties with um, hand dexterity. Um, his walking was getting worse, balance was off. He had a, several upper motor neuron signs on, on neurologic exam. His MJOA was calculated to be 13. And you can see on his MRI, he has two level cord compression with some T2 hyperintensity in the core at, at C67 level. So based on um, you know, his MJOA being 13 and his presenting um, history and physical, I think there's not much controversy. I mean, this patient should be treated with surgery. The evidence supports that, expert opinion supports that, and, and the guidelines reflect this principle. 
with a strong recommendation. And the same principle really applies for anybody presenting with severe cervical myelopathy. These patients should have surgery barring any really severe mitigating factors. But a more complex, I think an interesting uh, question in patient population is, is that, that depicted here, a 45 year old professional at the, really the height of his career, very fit and healthy, uh, has some numbness in his thumb and he has an MRI which demonstrates uh, some two, evidence of two-level cord compression. Um, and if you look at his MJOA, it's, it's 17. Certainly based on the fact that he has some, myelopathy, some features of myelopathy, albeit somewhat soft features, and the fact that he has cord compression, we could offer this patient surgery, but you know, it's not exactly a chip shot for him. He has to take off work for probably several months. Um, he's sidelined for some time. Um, and there's obviously risks of complications with surgery. So how should we approach the decision-making when dealing with a person such as this? Factors to consider are several. I think the crux of this problem is really what is the natural history of patients with uh, mild cervical myelopathy without surgery? What does the future hold if they're left to their own devices with, without an operation? Are there specific clinical or imaging uh, predictors of progression such that we can identify high-risk individuals for early selective surgery and maybe watch the rest? What's the evidence surrounding uh, efficacy uh, of surgery versus non-operative care? And what's the complication profile of surgery? These are all things to consider. So if we look at our ledger and evaluate the pros and cons of operating on patients with mild cervical myelopathy, I think these are the pertinent points. The pros are that Yes, if we operate on these individuals, I think we will pretty effectively prevent future deterioration. Um, we also have shown that it, uh, both Dr. Gogowala's work and Dr. Failing's work in a, a large AO study shows that we also actually improve clinical status. Um, would we potentially also prevent these rare cases of cervical spinal cord injury that happen with patients that have mild cervical myelopathy? When you look at the con side of the ledger, there are also some things to consider, however, um, like depicted in our case, most of the patients have very good functionality and quality of life. They're working, doing surgery, again, will sideline them. And that may not be acceptable to folks that are feeling, objectively speaking, quite well. Of course, many patients that have mild cervical myelopathy, we know, may not deteriorate. And it's difficult to predict exactly who will deteriorate. So by operating on everybody, maybe we're over-operating or potentially we could defer an operation on some of these folks to a later stage in life when they're not, when they're not working and less active. And of course, we all know that there are risks of, of complications with surgery. We, we went through um, looking at the questions surrounding natural history several years ago as part of the guidelines effort, and we've updated this in recent years, but the evidence hasn't changed much. Um, we basically observed that on average, about 20 to 62% of patients with uh, cervical myelopathy will deteriorate at least one point in the MJOA scale after three to six years after initial assessment. So this is really an imprecise uh, estimate. That's not so useful to help clinicians um, determine how to counsel patients and, and, and not so useful indicating practice. Is there, are there, is there any evidence about who will deteriorate? Well, not really. There's not consistent evidence in the literature that any demographic variables, disease variables will predict uh, a progression with non-operative care. There has been a radiologic study that showed that a more circumferential kind of socked in compression of the spinal cord predicts or portends a more um, higher risk of deterioration with non-operative care as compared to partial or unilateral compression that hasn't been replicated in the literature. What about the risk of spinal cord injury? The best evidence comes from population-based cohort studies out of Taiwan, and these show that in patients with cervical myelopathy, due to degenerative disease or OPLL, although the risk of spinal cord injury is still low, it, relatively speaking, it is higher than the average population, as high as 32-fold higher. Is this enough to justify operating on all these patients? Probably not, but something to consider. What's the evidence for operative versus non-operative care in patients with mild cervical myelopathy? Well, actually, there is an RCT performed by Kadanka. He randomized 64 patients to either uh, operative or non-operative care. Um, I put in quotations, mild or cervical myelopathy, because some of these actually by our current definitions would be moderate in nature. So those that had MGOA greater than 12 were included. He followed them up to 10 years and there were some methodologic limitations. There was a significant loss to follow up rate. There were some issues surrounding blinding. Um, but in summary, at 
at the 10 year mark, there was really no clinical or statistically significant difference between those who had surgery and those who didn't with respect to change in MGOA and ability to uh, carry out activities of daily living. So I think this is some evidence that patients treated non-operatively can actually sustain reasonable functionality and they, ne they don't necessarily all deteriorate. So maybe following some of these patients is appropriate. What's the efficacy of surgery for cervical myelopathy patients? Well, uh, this data has already been shown, but in the large AO studies and other studies, we've seen that, um, in fact, uh, patients don't just remain stable, they improve. So across the spectrum of injury severity and across multiple domains of outcome measure assessment, patients actually do, statistically speaking, on average, get better, even in the mild group. But we know that uh, surgery is not innocuous. There are risks of complications between about 15 to 20 percent of patients treated with cervical myelopathy surgery get complications, and about a third of these are serious. So if a mild patient is operated on, and God forbid they get a delayed C5 palsy or severe dysphagia, you know, that may, 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 that may make you or them regret the decision. So I think it's just something to consider here. So the take-home points, I think, with respect to mild cervical myelopathy, our current evidence surrounding the natural history is poor and it's imprecise. And as of yet, we don't have any reliable predictors of clinical progression. Uh, with all this said, um, both uh, initial operation at the time of diagnosis or close observation with mild cervical myelopathy patients, I think are reasonable options. If the decision is to not operate, I think uh, the, the, the main take on point is these patients can't just be abandoned. First of all, they need to be educated about what deterioration will look like, what they need to watch out for, uh, what should prompt an urgent visit to the emergency department or call to their spine surgeon. Um, and um, if they are followed, uh, you, you know, you need to really document the neurologic exam and the neurologic assessment to, to provide a benchmark of where, how patients are over time. If patients are followed and they deteriorate or they fail to improve, then surgery is likely the, 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 uh, the preferred treatment option, and this is reflected in the guidelines. Um, I think we all acknowledge that there is room for better um, evidence on this topic, and we're trying to do better. Uh, about three years ago, we initiated a prospective cohort study to follow patients with mild cervical myelopathy up to five years, and all these patients will be treated non-operatively to start. And the goal is to identify really what the rate of deterioration is amongst this uh, cohort of, of individuals, and also to identify predictors of, of deterioration such that we can identify a high risk group and maybe these patients will be targeted with early selective surgery and at presentation we're collecting all sorts of data including microstructural MRI, DTI, blood biomarkers, sophisticated hand function, walking tests, and the thought is that eventually we'll be able to Calculate, calculate individual risk predictions at patient, patient presentation for those with mild cervical myelopathy and make, make an evidence-based uh, treatment recommendation based on this data. We've enrolled about 120 patients, so we're about halfway. Um, and we anticipate that this study will take about another five years to complete, but hopefully we'll be able to, to update you when it's done with some, some better uh, evidence surrounding this topic, which will help you guide your practice. Finally, I just want to talk briefly about asymptomatic cord compression, which is an analogous topic, which um, is discussed often and we see often, again, with uh, the increased availability of MRI. We see a lot of these patients that come with neck pain and have an MRI, and incidentally, we see their cord is compressed. This is a, a, a case example of a retired engineer who has some neck pain symptoms and probably some left-sided particular uh, pain symptoms. Um, some pain going into his left shoulder, but really no concrete signs of myelopathy on exam as MJOA is 18. So what do we do with this patient? Uh, should he be followed? Should it be operated on? Uh, about 10 years ago, we actually did a survey of about 700 spine surgeons through AO, and we uh, posed different questions to them uh, based on this specific uh, uh, or analogous case examples, patients with minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic cord compression, and we asked them whether they would operate and what they, how they would, how, what their preferences and practice patterns would be for such cases. And this is an example of a 47 year old patient who has significant cord compression, but neck pain only, no symptoms or signs of myelopathy. And interestingly, over two thirds said that they would operate with just one third saying that they would watch and wait. But we presented a, another uh, patient case for a, a 47 year old who had actually mild myelopathy symptoms, but less severe cord compression. And, um, uh, a little less than two thirds said they would operate. So in this instance, we found that the spine surgery community really 
put a lot of weight in what the MRI showed, and uh, maybe in this instance, less weight in what the neurologic exam showed. Um, there are factors to consider again in, 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 in weighing treatment options. Uh, these, a lot of these parallel the, the conversations from surrounding mild myelopathy. This was, I think, a wonderful study performed by Dr. Bednarik, um, who he actually enrolled 199 patients with cervical stenosis, but no myelopathy symptoms. And he followed them for a long time. And he showed that 22% developed some symptoms of myelopathy at um, just under four years follow-up. The only real predictor of, of uh, progression in the way of myelopathy development was clinical or electrophysiologic evidence of radiculopathy, but nothing else, not even MRI findings was, were so predictive. Even the presence of T, T2 signal change wasn't so declarative. There um, was one patient, um, or sorry, there were 14 patients within this cohort that had a traumatic event, and none of them had a catastrophic spinal cord injury. One did lead to the develop of, de development of myelopathic symptoms, however, and this also uh, this, this finding is, is mirrored by other studies, including that by Chang et al., who showed that 55 patients um, had presymptomatic or asymptomatic cord compression, and of them, 18% had trauma, but there was really no severe catastrophic spinal cord injury that developed. So take-home points, uh, about one quarter of patients with asymptomatic cervical stenosis will, uh, will develop signs of myelopathy over four years. Radiculopathy may predict this progression. Um, and so this has been used by certain individuals to justify um, or uh, advocate for surgery in, in these individuals, which, which I think is not unreasonable. The risk of, of spinal cord injury uh, with trauma in this population is likely low. And even though we were worried about it and we counsel patients about avoiding high-risk activities, uh, skiing, contact sports, et cetera, uh, and, uh, the, the evidence bears out that the risk of one of these catastrophic SCIs in, in this patient population is actually quite low. So just finishing with the case that I showed this, this engineer who had neck pain and radiculopathy actually ended up undergoing surgery for his uh, radiculopathy and uh, he, he, did, he did fine. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'm looking forward to uh, more discussions about, about myelopathy. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Jeff and uh, Zoe. So there's a, a question from Dr. Andrew Platt in this. I'll paraphrase the question, but essentially maybe I'll ask each of you, what are your thoughts on the role of um, artificial cervical disc in um, uh, the management of degenerative cervical myelopathy? So maybe Zoe and then uh, Jeff, and then I'll, while you're discussing this, I'll, I'll uh, share my screen. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Michael. I think that's a really, really important question. And uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I take away from the cervical uh, myelopathy uh, trial uh, that we did looking at anterior versus posterior is that perhaps one of the messages in seeing the uh, superior outcomes, albeit um, not from the randomized comparison, but the uh, superior outcomes with laminoplasty may represent uh, the importance of preserving motion uh, when we treat these patients. Um, I think that um, based on the evidence that we have today, uh, treating a patient with cervical myelopathy with one or two levels of cervical spondylosis with uh, cervical arthroplasty um, is uh, probably reasonable. Um, I don't think that we uh, have evidence to support treating uh, patients with three or more levels of stenosis with uh, arthroplasty is uh, is there uh, right now. Um, but I think it's an important thing that we should look at in future uh, prospective studies, um, looking at motion preservation versus not, because it may turn out to be a very, very important aspect of um, uh, patients' overall quality of life. Thank you, Zoe. And uh, Jeff, your thoughts? I agree. I think uh, at our hospital, we tend to reserve arthroplasty for patients um, that have, are typically the younger patient with the soft disc herniation who has um, more of a radiculopathy or myelopathy picture uh, affecting one or two levels with reasonable alignment, minimal neck pain symptoms. Um, we tend to avoid it for the patient with myelopathy that has a really advanced degree of spondylosis, a spine that looks like it wants to fuse. Um, you know, in my experience, those tend to just go on to fuse anyways, uh, even, even, even with uh, our artificial disc placement. 
So um, I think uh, I think it's a great option. The evidence seems to bear out that it it uh, is at least equivalent, if not somewhat superior, in certain instances to to ACDF. And I think it's something we got to tell our patients about in, in in the right circumstances. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm going to go back to the polling questions, and uh, let's just see, you know, kind of what what your viewpoints are after listening to these uh, a lecture. So here we have this uh, this patient with multi-level spondylosis and MDOA of 16, an initial presentation. And then, so the polling question one, uh, who would opt for surgery at this point? Who would get further studies? So for example, neurophysiological studies, who would opt for non-operative management, but essentially uh, discharging from the clinic with the option for the family doctor to re-refer. And then non-operative uh, management uh, under the supervision of the spine surgeon with structured rehab, and then a follow-up, and then advice for surgery if there's a deterioration. So let's see what the um, responses are here. Yeah, so I think that uh, perhaps there's a slight uh, increase in the um, proportion of people that would opt for non-operative management with, with a follow-up by the spine surgeon um, uh, uh, themselves. And I think that's a, certainly a very good, uh, uh, you know, very good option. So in fact, this is what was done. Uh, so of course, the structured physiotherapy was done. And then I saw the patient for a month follow-up. And then there was a, um, a slight but significant deterioration from an injury of 16 uh, to 14. And now the patient was noticing uh, symptoms and was ex expressing some concern. So pull in question two. Uh, we can probably, uh, you know, we can go over this question again, but I think everyone opted for, for surgery here, but um, let's just uh, see if anybody, uh, I doubt anybody changed their minds, but let's see. Yeah, so that's no surprise, but let's, this is kind of an interesting one here. So assuming a surgical approach is adopted, um, in this case, uh, what are you gonna do? So front or back, uh, ACDF, uh, laminectomy, laminoplasty, multi-level fusion, anterior posterior. So let's see what preferred options here are. Okay, so a uh, smaller percentage uh, did both a kind of an anterior and a posterior uh, decompression and in uh, uh, infusion, and I, I think I would kind of personally support that. Uh, uh, that that you, I think one should probably be fairly selective about when you go front and back. But uh, the remaining options are are you know there's a, a fairly even, fairly even uh, a, a split, which which I think is understandable because the the case in question is one that can be treated with a variety of, uh, of options. So maybe I'll just ask the, uh, the faculty, um, you know, maybe Jeff and, and then Zoe, uh, how, what would be your uh, preferred uh, choice? So this is say this person has deteriorated or an MGOA of, uh, of 14. I think it could be a bit of dealer's choice, but personally, you know, the, the reasonable alignment, multi-level, it looks like there's at least three levels, if not, yeah, at least three levels. I would probably do a posterior uh, decompression infusion for this patient, although I acknowledge that laminoplasty is a, is a good option. I also don't think multi-level ACD would be wrong, but probably I would go from the back with the decompression infusion. And I think a lot of people probably agree with you. So, and then what about you, Zoe? I think I know the answer, but let's hear what you say. Yeah, no, I think uh, looking at this case with preserved uh, cervical, uh, relatively preserved cervical lordosis uh, and uh, multi-level disease, three levels of stenosis, um, I would favor laminoplasty uh, in this case. Uh, I would, uh, I would uh, acknowledge that uh, posterior cervical decompression infusion uh, and multi-level ACDNF are also viable uh, options, but I, I would do a laminoplasty here. Okay, cool. And I'll show you what I did. I did something different. I think uh, uh, Jeff probably would know what I would what I would do. So I'm a big fan of kind of the multi-level ACDF. So that's what I did here, and uh, uh, you know she did she did pretty uh, she did pretty well, and I followed her for some uh, kind of for some time. 
but there's certainly kind of a variety of uh, kind of 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 of, uh, of, of options uh, here. So we just have a couple of we're almost out of time, but we just have a couple of other uh, questions here. So we have a question for one of our U of T spine fellows, uh, Nader Hajrati, uh, uh, Jeffers, Dr. Uh, Wilson. Uh, how would you argue on the increasing incidence of incomplete traumatic SCI in the elderly population if not for pre-existing degenerative changes in the cervical spine in association with a minor a trauma such as a hyperextension injury? I'm just wondering if that question was planted with uh, Dr. Uh, Hijrati saying that's a major area of your, your own interest, uh, Jeff, but how would you respond to that? No, it's a good point. I mean, um, I think this is the most common type of spinal cord injury we're seeing nowadays. And presumably a lot of these patients have some pre-existing, certainly stenosis, if not myelopathy. Um, and, you know, as we get older, we know that pretty much everybody gets cervical stenosis and probably um, a lot of folks get myelopathy that's just not clinically apparent or detected. So I agree with you that, that this is an issue. Um, I think um, at the moment though, we don't have any evidence to say, okay, well, every patient that has mild myelopathy, mild myelopathy and cervical stenosis or asymptomatic cord compression in this context um, should have surgery to prevent that sort of um, incident from happening. Um, so, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I don't think we can make the leap yet to say, okay, these patients need to, to all have surgery to prevent a spinal cord injury. Yeah, um, I think that's I think that's probably I think that's probably correct. Um, uh, Zoe, um, what what do you counsel patients in terms of uh, the risk of uh, of, uh, of, sp of spinal cord injury? So you know, I, I try uh, my best. Uh, not to be alarmist uh, with patients uh, because a number of patients um, come in with that concern that you know their uh, MRI is showing this you know very very uh, you know tight stenosis with compression of their spinal cord and am I going to become paralyzed? And I and I I, I tell them that the the data here um, really uh, does not suggest that they have an enormous risk for a catastrophic uh, spinal cord injury, but that. The data, and I think the the, the work, uh, Michael, that you've shown from the AO studies is really compelling. That patients with mild symptoms, and a lot of times patients don't even realize that they have these mild uh, symptoms of cervical myelopathy. And I would just stress that as a as a real take home message for this group that um, cervical myelopathy is probably underdiagnosed, and that when patients have truly mild symptoms they probably should at least be sitting down with a surgeon to discuss uh, surgical options. I personally, usually when I have that type of discussion with patients, we'll see them back in three to six months and, uh, and then counsel them again. But uh, increasingly, I'm recommending surgery to patients who have mild symptoms of cervical myelopathy. Beautiful. Um, there is uh, kind of one uh, final question in the uh, in the Q&A, then I think maybe we'll close out. I'll kind of paraphrase the question. So um, uh, what would your um, advice be for, say, a person who's coming to see you with you who's had um, ACDFs in the cervical spine before, now has adjacent segment, a degenerative disease with mild DCM? Should they go for further fusion surgery? Uh, or should they consider the option of an arthroplasty? Maybe a quick answer from you, uh, Jeff, and then Zoe. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to say. Uh, I, I think in general, preserving motion is an important uh, principle. And without seeing the films, it's a bit difficult to say, but I think those options should be entertained wherever possible. Okay, and so? I'll just highlight one of the final slides that I put into my talk that uh, there are, there are there's published literature on looking at patients with uh, multi-level anterior cervical fusion who developed ACM. Oh. And, myelopathy. and uh, a large number, um, over 80% of these patients uh, improve uh, when treated with laminoplasty in that context. And yeah. so it doesn't necessarily mean that every single patient with that type of uh, adjacent level disease is appropriate for laminoplasty, but I think it should be strongly considered uh, in those patients. Great. So I think on that note, I think we'll uh, close things out. I just uh, want to thank uh, 
our, our faculty, Drs. Uh, Wilson and Ogawala for excellent lectures. Want to thank the, uh, the staff at uh, AO North America for all of their support and all of the, uh, the fellows and faculty that have joined us on this webinar. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that this will actually be posted on a YouTube channel at some point. So if you have trouble with uh, insomnia, you know, we will give you the, uh, the YouTube uh, video, video link. So just teasing. Uh, you know, I could talk about DCM forever, but I'm, I'm just a little bit biased. But uh, great fun being with, uh, with everybody here. And uh, Zoe and Jeff, uh, I learned a lot uh, from your uh, perspectives and wishing everyone uh, a good evening. Take care. You too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.